All right, thank you. And welcome to Mighty. Um, so evaluating the patient, yeah. Um, I don't think I have any consult, any disclosures uh, relevant to this. Um, PE, I think, just want to start by saying, you know, the statement in 2008 by General, the Surgeon General saying the most preventable cause of in-hospital mortality, uh, it's a fairly striking statement and I think still resonates with us today, is that still there are too many pulmonary emboli that happen that we should try and prevent. Obviously, it's much more a preventative aspect than it is the treatment. Um, so third most common cardiovascular condition following coronary disease and cardiovascular disease. Uh, epidemiology uh, from CDC is that up to 100,000 deaths per year in the United States uh, occur. Uh, that up to 30% of those patients can die within uh, a month and that they have a fairly high recurrence rate for all VTE patients. And it's interesting, this is likely uh, stated to be an underestimate because you know, a fair number of patients will present with, in fact, sudden death and the PE is not diagnosed until autopsy, if an autopsy is even done. So perhaps the number's higher. Um, epidemiology, uh, unselected population, uh, looking at uh, death rates and such, and how patients do. So again, a fairly high mortality rate, uh, that many of the patients die early when that happens. Uh, if you look at them and how they're doing, if they've had to have CPR, uh, then obviously their mortality is quite high. Um, if, it's, uh, you know, if it's a stable PE, then it's, it's gonna be considerably less. So small pulmonary emboli, relatively good, uh, but the severe ones are uh, quite high. <clears throat> The Methodist experience is we've been kind of diving into this idea of a PE response team and such. We've gone back and looked for, and I have the data through the first quarter of last year, but not the complete year for this one. So we've been seeing an increasing number. Uh, keep in mind that the top two numbers are the first year in 2014, then 2015, then the bottom one's just the quarter of uh, 2016, the first quarter. So over 400 cases per year is the trend. Um, the number of those that go that are into the ICU, so then, again, this is administrative data from diagnosis, from discharge diagnosis codes. So, you know, more than a third of those wind up in the ICU. Of the patients here that are in an ICU with a PE diagnosis, the mortality around 20%, uh, which is higher than the mortality index, <clears throat> uh, the higher than predicted. So we'd obviously like to influence that. Um, risk factors, modifiable, non-modifiable, so obesity, smoking, uh, steroid, uh, uh, um, hormones, et cetera, activity levels, immobilizations. Uh, previous VTE, the high, the, one of the strongest predictors, obviously, of uh, having a, uh, another VTE event uh, as we age and cancer, et cetera. So classic PE presentation is thought to be relatively uncommon, right, where somebody comes in with an abrupt onset of acute uh, chest pain, described many times as pleuritic, with dyspnea and hypoxia. Uh, and the differential diagnoses, uh, because the patients can come in with a variety of different complaints, you need to think about cardiac emergencies, obviously, to make sure these patients are not having MI or CHF exacerbation, et cetera. Uh, aortic dissection can have a similar presentation, uh, some acute pulmonary process or an acute exacerbation of a chronic process. Of course, when you think about uh, other things that can happen as well, uh, musculoskeletal complaints that can be similar, panic attacks, uh, trauma can obviously be a problem. I think it's important, uh, and I think that our emergency room does a pretty good job of this, actually, of picking up uh, pulmonary emboli, but uh, just recognize, again, that the patients may very well come in with non-classic symptoms, uh, characterize the complaints uh, in context of what their risk factors are, right, in recent events, uh, and keeping in mind atypical symptoms like fever, altered mineral status, uh, patients simply found down. There's a recent uh, article written saying that in patients presented with first-time syncope, the incidence of PE was up to 19%, which is pretty striking. Abdominal complaints obviously would distract you some from the true diagnosis, um, et cetera. And the exam, I think, is really important, obviously, to look for signs of clinical shock. Really important uh, to see what the stability is and run through the ABCs of uh, routine care. Uh, looking for obvious other pathology, uh, absent breast sounds on one side, or leg edema that might point you towards this, or absent lower extremity pulses, et cetera. Uh, the evaluation, uh, quite important for this to be a fairly rapid uh, assessment, uh, given the lethality of uh, this process. Uh, American College of Radiology recommends that chest x-ray be the first line um, imaging to rule out other non-PE uh, pulmonary and cardiac sources, but EKG, chest x-ray, rapid uh, entrance into some non uh, non-invasive uh, pulmonary imaging, which we'll get to in the next talk, I think. Uh, echocardiogram, venous duplex, a venous duplex fairly low on your list, and then lab studies. Uh, the D-dimers, uh, troponin, basic labs, and a BNP. 
So it's interesting as looking at the looking at the numbers in the data. So D-dimer, fairly good negative predictive value, but not so helpful to you if it's positive, right? So if it's negative, then perhaps uh, don't need to move on. Terponin, one of the markers, obviously, for cardiac injury. And if somebody has terponin that's positive in the face of PE, quite important. Basic labs to help us uh, direct the rest and BMP to make sure we're not having uh, CHF exacerbations, not so much to help us decide about PE. Uh, so this is from the, ES, the, Amer the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, uh, published a couple of years ago. Uh, talking about what to do in the evaluation if somebody has high index of suspicion based on clinical probability, then moving quickly to CT angiography is the uh, most rapid way to diagnose and then uh, differentiate uh, treatment options. If they don't, then starting off with D-dimer and then moving forward from there, that if it's positive, going and getting other imaging, and if not, then pursuing other diagnostic options. <clears throat> and then what? So ultimately, I think you want to be able to confirm the diagnosis and then classify the patient to determine what the treatment options are going to be. We'll be talking about that more as the day goes on. Really, it's the strong determining parameters are what's their hemodynamic stability? Have you been able to identify RV strain? Do they have positive biomarkers like troponins that are elevated? And what are the patient characteristics? Is this an old person who's been debilitated by stroke or dying of uh, some advanced cancer? Or is this a young, robust jogger who just happened to collapse or something like that? Uh, troponin predictive value. Uh, independent of RV enlargement has been shown pretty positively to predict what happens with PE death rates. And we'll see that go up, and it's, it's accelerated by, um, by RV enlargement. So if you have an, a troponin that's positive, uh, then that predicts, in the face of PE, that predicts your death being uh, considerably higher than if your troponin's negative. And if your RV is enlarged as well, it seems to uh, accelerate that. And that also contributes to all-cause mortality, where you can see a more than doubling of what we saw from PE-related deaths. So ultimately, in the PE classification that we'll talk more about, it's going to come down to is it massive or, in, or a high risk? Is it intermediate or submassive, or is it a low-risk patient? <clears throat> so I guess I'll kind of wrap up this part in saying that uh, VTEs uh, with PEs and DBTs are quite common. PE carries a really high mortality, and you need a high index of clinical suspicion. But prompt diagnosis uh, and treatment can greatly affect the outcomes. Thanks.